Hello, and I, today I have a special guest from Germany, Sebastian Klein. Welcome in the podcast. Thank you, and hello. Uh, we had an um, uh, introduction conversation already for 30 minutes, <laughs> I see now on the clock. <laughs> and it was all in German, but now, of course, we have to switch to English, otherwise it's going to probably be difficult for other people to follow. Um, like I said, when I noticed uh, what you're doing now uh, is working for the Neue Narrative. Narrative. Mm -hmm. um, that was that was the initial idea of contacting um, you and Lena uh, to see if somebody would talk to me for the podcast. And, and you said yes, of course. Um, but then I found out all the other things that you have been done, been doing, or still doing at the same time. You've written a book. Um, we're going to talk about that, um, of course. Uh, you have uh, started um, four companies, three, four. Um, I right. guess a few more, but some of them well, don't even more. exist anymore. <laughs> some of them don't. I'm not <laughs> proud of every single one. <laughs> How can you not be proud of all the companies you started? I mean, uh, one of the first companies was producing self-cooling scarves. I'm not sure if this is something the world needed. So the self yeah, <laughs> self cooling scars. Okay, tell me about that. Um, so the story is that a good one of my best friends, who's also um, still um, working at Blinkist, we got to know each other when we studied in Australia, and we also, after coming back to Europe, we both started working for consulting companies. I was working for BCG, and he was working for Atikani in Finland. And we both didn't like it very much and then quit. And then we had both just read um, Tim Ferriss, The Four Hour Work Week. You might be familiar with that and liked the idea of um, only working four hours per week. And we're looking for like a product that is easy to you know, produce and easy to sell. And we ended up with self-cooling uh, self scarves and um, called them penguin hugs, which I think <laughs> was a brilliant branding idea. Um, we ended up selling, I don't know, maybe 1,000 of them. So we didn't. We couldn't retire. Uh, it wasn't very successful, but that was one of the first attempts at being an entrepreneur in like in our twenties. Even and you say it's not successful, but I think the the way that I see it is that the basis um, it's the basis of all the business you started after that. So that that means uh, success in that way. I think so. Yeah, and I mean, I definitely learned something from it, and. Probably the most important learning for me was that there's something like marketing or sales, because I, I have a background in psychology, so I didn't study study business. And my idea was that like you just you know you create a product and you put it out there and then something will happen and people start buying it. I didn't know anything about marketing or sales, and that was like the biggest learning that if you don't do that, then nobody will buy your product. Yeah, and I think it is an important learning. Yeah. <laughs> I think so too. And, and I think that you see, see, I think it's always there's always um, things that you take along with the with your next journey, um, and this this was probably it. But I thought you already started a um, a student. Or no, maybe you was. I'm not sure if you started. Um, yeah, Flink. What is Flink then? So yeah, that was actually um, while studying, and um, two of the people I started it um, are also then turn out being my co-founders with Blinkist, which we started after the um, Penguin Hack business. And uh, Flink was, or is still, it still exists, is like a consulting company run by students. Yeah. And um, I, I, like we studied in the same town in Germany and there was already one similar consulting firm run by students and we didn't like it. So we said we're going to start our own and we'll make it cooler and more successful, which I think worked out. Um, and that was, I think that was also quite like it was, we learned a lot in it. We didn't also didn't make lots of money, but we learned a lot. <laughs> that was your first, was that actually the first company? Because the, 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 the cooler shop came after that? Um, so like while I studied, we also, we started like a, party series and then started producing t-shirts um the brand name was schnapps is liebe so liquor equals love a silly student idea 
Um, but I think that was more for our own entertain entertainment rather than like being, or, I mean, I think we were dreaming of becoming rich with the whole thing, but like that didn't happen. So, so money is a, um, is an important part on this, on this, what you're telling me right now is it's uh, everything you did was, um, uh, was a great idea, but money was not happening really as you expected. Um, I'm not sure about Flink, but the other two, um, for sure. Did you did you break even on the idea of the cool sh the, the the scarves? No, did you not lose really. Money? You no, lost money. I mean it, it was also I think a bit of a gamble to say, like I think we had to send more or less like cash to China to have the scarves like you know a few thousand euros to have the scarves produced and then we didn't know if anything would come back but it did. Um, yeah, I have to say like no, none of these first businesses they were all like losses which might also have to do with my psychology background because there you don't really learn a lot about like you know that a business has to be profitable and earn money we were like when you study psychology i think you're used to only think about like the people in the organization and like how they feel and how they're doing so i had to to learn to think about money i, I knew i wanted to run companies and start companies um and i think for most people who have a business background it's kind of ironic as someone or like crazy that someone wants to run a company without thinking about money. I'm not sure. Is it really that you're running a business without thinking about money? Or are, you, are you not thinking about the profits? That's a good question. I mean, I mean, I think it's just, it's really part of running a business that you also have to think about money. I, I still think that money shouldn't be like the most important or like the, the like the you know the, the top of the list which beats everything else which i think is what many people are doing when they run companies i just but i i had to learn that it's like you know as important as thinking of other factors in the organization because if you don't if you can't manage to make money then the company just doesn't exist yeah like some of my attempts at being an entrepreneur. <laughs> well, that was, that's, that was a good experiment because then you found out if you don't make money, you don't really have a business. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> so, so why did you, st why did you go to study psychology? Um, I, like, honestly, I, I would say out of interest, I was just, you know, when I went to high school, I was just looking at what are the options and psychology just sounds like something that is important for anything you want to do because you're always working with people so at, at the end like an organization is always people the people who run it um yeah and maybe that's also the reason why i didn't think about money because i thought like only the people are people are mattering um yeah and i, I would still say it was a good choice like learning lots about how the mind works and how people tick and how groups work is, I think it's really helpful and valuable. Hmm. I, I can see that how your education is really um, a red threat in, in what you're doing in, in how your businesses have developed and uh, what I've read from the book and how the ideas are behind your organizational development process. Um, yeah, I can see how that how that really ties everything together. You said you, you always wanted to start businesses or run businesses. Where did you get that idea? Mm, I think I probably learned quite early that I'm not a good employee. Like, I, you know, the first internship I did was a catastrophe. I didn't last longer than two weeks because I just I didn't get along with the guy who run ran the company. Um, and I, also my mother said that at some point that she could never like see me as someone who works for others because I think I always have my own ideas about how things should be. So yeah, I, I figured out quite early that I'm not a good employee. And I also figured out that I don't like to work too much by myself, like being just, you know, just a writer who locks himself up in a cabin. Um, so if you if you want to do what you think, like if you have your own ideas about how to run things and you want to work with other people, then I think starting companies is one of the only options you have. And and did you did you also think about because now you say companies? Mm -hmm. Did you already think about that you're going to have multiple companies? 
Mm. Probably not. Like, um, I think it was more that like whenever I started something, then after a while I figured that, you know, I saw something that I would do different the next time, but it would be quite hard to change. Um, right now, I feel that like for the first time, I'm getting the impression that I know enough about organizations that there won't be any big surprises. So I'm, I don't expect myself to discover something next year where I say, ah, oh, this is something I would do different next time. So I have to start something new. Um, so right now I would say I'm not really seeing myself starting another company next few years, but ask me again in two years, maybe <laughs> things have changed. <laughs> so, so what is it that, because I, I think Blinkist is, is really the first big company. Um, oh no, the dive is, no, the Blinkist is, is the oldest one, right? So what is it that you thought at Blinkist that you really needed to change and you couldn't change internally? Mm. So, like, there are uh, several things. Um, I mean, Blinkist is an awesome company. I think I would, I wouldn't mind still working there. Um, and at the same time, like, one I discovered, like, while we were um, building up Blinkist, I discovered this whole, like, um, these, these whole new ideas about how a decentralized organization can run, which is not not so hierarchical and has more like, you know, autonomous parts that do something that not like the top of the pyramid um, influences. Um, I discovered that and I wanted more of it, which wasn't really possible inside this company. And one of the reasons is that Blinkist is like, a, it's like an, a startup which has, you know, venture capital investors who have a very clear um, idea about what they want in terms of gro growth and also returns at some point and who also influence how the company is like developing in terms of what people are doing and which products are being built. So in this setup, you can't really, I think you can't really build something that is completely decentralized because you have like a really influential or you have really influential stakeholders who want control and who want to know what is going to happen and who don't like this crazy idea of, you know, having lots of people who make their own decisions. Um, and I, I think, or like one of my learnings was I don't want to work in an environment where like external investors own your company and you as a founder are like more or less an employee of those investors which is what you end up being in such a setting so um uh, for, i of course have been reading your bio and book and everything so for people who don't know you what is what does blinkist do so blinkist summarizes business books um, so what most people use it for is to get like the key insights out of popular business or like nonfiction books. Most people use the audio version, so they just get these 15 minutes um, audio summaries. And we started by, we started not having audio, we just started by written summaries, uh, which is also where I come from. I have a, like one of my biggest passions is writing and reading books. Um, and yeah, I think like Blink is only turned out to be successful when we introduced the audio feature, um, which was also something I wasn't super excited about because I'm not so much, um, or I, I didn't used to, I haven't used to be an audio user. Um, so like, uh, of course, it's good that other people had this idea of introducing audio because this made the uh, app successful in the end. And, and um, you are less involved now. Are you still, owner of the company? I'm still one of the shareholders. So right. I'm one of, oh, of sure. those, one of those passive people outside the organization, which own parts of the organization, Right. Um, which I, I think is not a good thing in the end for an organization, having all those, you know, outside owners. But is it, would it be more interesting than organizational wise? Um, for the for blink is that you sell your shares mm, the question is to whom <clears throat> to, like, to, to the company to the company yeah I mean my personal opinion now is that like the the greater the overlap between people who run the organization and people who own the organization the better mm -hmm. so like and what we see with most you know of these venture capital kind of startups is that you have like tons of employees who have zero shares or like 
sometimes they have something that is sold to them like as shares, but is only basically like a exit bonus. And you have lots of ownership outside your organization, which I think isn't so good. So yeah, I would say it's, it's always good to have people who run the organization on the organization. Mm -hmm. So if you would, sh <clears throat> the way I, way I can imagine is if you would sh sell your shares to um, the people that work there now, um, that would just um, balance it a bit. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, like this is, this is also like with our current company, this is um, what, what we try to do there with this steward ownership model. So the, the company basically owns itself. So it's, if I leave the company now, it's not that I still own parts of the company. Only, only as long as I'm an employee in the organization, I have like voting rights. Uh, but as soon as I leave it, then I don't have any ownership. Yeah, I've been, <clears throat> I've been looking at um, an Arte documentary. I've also mm -hmm. written a post about it, um, where um, a couple of companies um, were, were shown, like um, the um, search engine um, Ecosia. E yeah. Ecosia. Um, but also a um, uh, uh, Elu Bao, Elu Bao, Elu Bao. Mm -hmm. and um, the the thing what the owner of Elu Bao is that he because he was he was the f um, uh, um, the only shareholder he, mm -hmm. he inherited from his father, and and he he thought it was not a great idea to keep it that way because he thought it would be more fair to. Um, divide the shares um, also with the employees. Mm -hmm. And the process to do this took him um, six or seven years. Mm -hmm. And it cost him one and a half million euros to really get it organized because it was not, it, it, it's very difficult to organize, apparently, um, which I didn't know because, and I'm finding out, I'm just having people like you in my podcast to learn about this because I believe in this idea, what you just described, in this um, yeah, fair shareholdership where mm -hmm. everybody owns a part of the company and you work as an employee for your own company, you work for your own future. And um, I think that is, that is a great idea. And I, I, I find it hard to imagine why you want it differently. But of course, I'm, I'm more in, in that um, mm -hmm. arena than in the shareholder arena. Um, so, so, and and you talk about the current company, which is Neue Narrative. Um, so, tell me, how did you arrange that? How did you how did you do that? Mm -hmm. So for us, it only lasted. It only took us one year, and it it was it was still way more expensive than I expected. But not uh, luckily, not not one million euros. Um, yeah. So like. Our current company, we, we started as a project inside another company. The Dive, and then we yes. Inside the Dive, which is a think tank in, in Berlin and Munich. On, and then we said, okay, we're going to start. And we started this print magazine just out of passion because we were crazy and thought that <laughs> the world needed another print magazine. <laughs> of um, course, there aren't just, there aren't just enough. <laughs> exactly. And it's also like super easy in terms of business model, especially, <laughs> especially if you refuse to like do anything with ads <laughs> so i uh, also had a few lessons to learn there. <laughs> but then we said at some point okay like we have so such just such good momentum and like so much so much good feedback from the people who subscribe to this magazine and so many ideas plus also we figured that like what the dive was doing and what we were doing there in this publishing world that just you know sometimes things fit together in one organization and they can help each other and this was just like so different we figured it, it's much more effective and efficient to just have two organizations. And we said, okay, Neue Narrative or NN Publishing is, is the name of the company is going to be its own entity. And we're going to do the steward ownership model. And we thought, okay, we just decided. And then it's more or less done just like with, with me and the product and then marketing sales, um, which wasn't right. Like we, it still took us quite a few steps and also like we had to pay a lot of money to lawyers and notaries to get it done. Um, but I have to say, like, I really feel it makes a difference. Like 
to be completely honest right now it doesn't in the end it doesn't really make a difference because the only difference that it actually makes is when you try to take profits out of the company uh, we don't make any profit so it's impossible or if you try to sell the company which is also impossible at this stage so like just factually it doesn't really make a difference um, but it does make a difference in terms of the people in the organization because you know everybody knows that like we own the company together and there's like this shared sense of ownership and there's like there's no one to blame if things go like everybody has to blame themselves or like the group everyone if something goes wrong and i'm getting the impression this really puts us you know on the same level and makes makes things really different in in the way we work together how many people do work there now um right now we are 15 15 do you think that you could implement um, this structure in any size company? I know there are examples of large companies. I know there are. But do you think that you can you can do this? Because of course, in Germany we have Bosch and we have um, Size. Uh, we have in the UK we have examples of, of large companies who have this structure in some kind of form. Mm -hmm. But. I, I, I also feel, and I, that's why I'm checking, right? That's, I also feel that it is, it is very suitable for a smaller company um, to get the drive of all the people because you all own a part of a company and you're all driven to really um, push the company forward, to really make it grow and, um, and make it sustainable. Mm -hmm. mm. So first of all, steward ownership doesn't necessarily mean that everyone owns the company like as the name suggests it's also you can say like that based, for example you just as one person own the company as a steward so it's different kind of ownership it can still be just you or like a couple of people who are these stewards um but what what you always say is that like you know being a steward doesn't mean you can exit the company and become a billionaire by selling it to amazon that's always like impossible um which i think is very important and also something more companies should do why why is it important to you um like my feeling is that like the greater the inequalities in terms of you know somebody being as rich as jeff bezos or elon musk and other people being like the the poor bastards working for a minimal wage i think it's just harmful for societies i also think it's bad for people like the, the bigger the inequalities the more you know um people start hating each other and i, I think organizations and societies are starting to divide um I mean, as you can see in the US right now, there's like a huge divide and the inequality has been like increasing over the last, I think, 30 or 40 years. Like, like you can really see that in the numbers. And we, we have a similar um, development in Germany, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And I personally think it's just something we all should be aware of that this is like harmful for societies and we should do something against it. Um, and I like, as I see it, I think everyone is okay with an entrepreneur who takes risks and who works a lot being, you know, a millionaire at some point if they are successful. I think most people don't have a problem with someone, you know, having like a nice house and more money than the neighbor. But I think the world doesn't sure? need. Yeah, I think as, as long as I, I don't think someone needs to own, you know, hundreds of millions of euros or like be a billionaire. I think that's just where the problems start. You know, if someone's just like a little bit richer than other people, I don't think people have a problem with that. I'm not sure. Um, and I, we, we both, in this introduction, before we started the conversation here in the podcast, we talked about the book of Maria, Mariana Mazzucato. Mm -hmm. And she describes um, how the way that, um, why shareholders believe they have the most risk and why they should get the biggest payout or mm -hmm. you know all the dividends or all the profits and if you if if you read that part in a book which i really like the idea is mm -hmm. it is a it's a fake idea as an employee um mm -hmm. you take risks as well yeah, you work true. in a company you could be sacked tomorrow 
um, you, you, you develop everything you do, all your knowledge is developed on this company and most of it you can't use anywhere else because it's very specific. You, you also take a lot of risks and you work away, away from your hometown, you travel. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of risks involved which um, shareholders don't call risk, they call security. Mm -hmm. And I think it. I think it's a. It's a. It's a false picture. But I'm not. I'm, I'm checking. <laughs> I mean, I, I totally agree. I also um, last year I read the Piketty books, mm -hmm. and he also writes a lot about these these narratives that like you know wealthy people um, keep telling because they you know protect their their status and make it easier for them to like um, get rents. I think um, Mariana Matsukato also writes a lot about these rents as unearned income, um, and it's definitely true. I also I also thought that at some point when I was working at Blinkist that like we're always talking about the entrepreneurial risks, while in end I always thought okay, the employees have especially in the beginning of such a startup, employees have a much higher risk because they they don't know when the company is about to to you know go bankrupt and they have a shitty salary too. Um, but I would still say that, you know, if someone, let, let's just assume someone is, you know, taking some risks and like putting in hard work and like has some great ideas and builds something. And uh, I think most people would be okay. And if that person, you know, some people don't really value being wealthy or like having a nice house and a nice mm -hmm. car, but if you are the kind of person who needs that and wants it and works hard for it and then gets this nice house and one nice car, I think most people are fine with it. But if you own an island and like an airplane and, you know, 20 cars, yeah. I think at some point people will start uh, like not understanding why they should work like a second job to pay school bills while you just have so much money. Yeah, I agree. In, in the documentary by Arte, um, there's another company, and I forgot the name of the company, but it's 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 uh, it's also I think it's in Berlin. Um, there's two founders, and they produce biological um, tampons and condoms. Einhorn, yeah, yeah. Einhorn, also correct. I, I thought if I'm going to tell you this, you know what they are. Yeah. <laughs> Einhorn, and uh, I just uh, and the, the whole document. Oh no, that's that's not that's not on Arte. That's on Tegenit, which is a, a, a Dutch. Um, Mm. Um, program, and it, it's a it's a really good documentary because the the two guys from Einhorn they are like the narrators of the documentary, which is it's, mm -hmm. so it's not the documentary maker who's who's doing this. They are telling and they are also introducing these other companies, which is I thought it was really well done. But the thing is, at some point he's talking about so we signed away the ownership of of, of our company, which mm -hmm. um, on one part feels really good. You know, like you just described, uh, what it does to you and it equalizes everything and um, all this other stuff. But also, um, it feels really shitty because now you can't buy that car anymore that you dreamt of when you were like 20. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that is that's that was an interesting contradiction. Um, it, it's at, at some point you feel good, and at the same point you are so um, brainwashed. Mm -hmm. by 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 the media the marketing everything that we do that you need more and more and more you need a bigger car you need a better house that it also feels bad that you've signed away because now i don't ever get that one million or ten million anymore because it's gone mm -hmm. <laughs> do you have a similar feeling <laughs> yeah i mean on the one hand even in this uh, steward ownership model what we also did is we created some um, founders shares, which are, which, um, how should I describe it? So they are called founders shares and they have a value, mm -hmm. um, and their value increases over time, but they have a cap. So we said in the very beginning, when we started the company, um, there are 1 million founders shares and they're worth 1 million now, and they can develop over time and they can grow to a total value of 2.5 million euros. And this is like like all of these shares can be distributed in the team over the first couple of years and like basically being something if, if like I, for instance, if I take a shitty salary in the first couple of years, then this can be like an extra compensation for my risk I took. And then if the company is successful, they can buy back those shares. 
uh, which means you know I'm not going to be like a billionaire out of this, but there can be some um, like a bonus for the risk I took in the early yeah. days once the company is successful. So you can do that, and I, I think it's I think it it makes sense to do that if you if you have people who are motivated by that. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, I'm I'm feeling more and more that like wealth is also just you know separating people. Hmm. I think it's much better to have good relationships to other people than a good relationship to your expensive car thing and or like to your two lofts. I think that's also what happens a lot with people who own a lot. Yeah, and that's what I'm that's what I'm just saying in the beginning. I can see the total connection to your studies that you've been doing on psychology and all the things that you've been developing in the meantime. So um, I what you're just say, which is telling me is just this is what I'm hearing is is everything you told in the beginning about why you went to study psychology, you were more interested in people and, um, and the working together, that, that all um, explains this for me. Uh, it mm -hmm. sounds really uh, beautiful. And um, the, the ownership part, I, I also remember one other thing, um, because you can put down a lot of rules, like you said, with, 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 when you have this uh, set up with the ownership. And another thing that I also liked, and, and I think it was with this um, English company, I forgot the name. They have like a bandwidth of the least and most paid employee in the company, which is fixed. It cannot be more than, I think it was seven, seven times um, the least paid and the most paid uh, person in the company. And I also like that idea that you have like a gap, um, uh, um, a bandwidth uh, on, on what the maximum can be. Because what I, what is very human is that if you at one point make, um, like say 100,000 euros a year, and um, then you get used to this amount, right? So mm -hmm. the next time um, when you are discussing your salary, you think, okay, now I need 120,000 euros because now my kids go to school, a different school that it costs more, I need more money. So that's how we think, that's how, how this works. And so in, in a very natural way, this distance um, could grow mm -hmm. as, uh, more apart. And because then if you like have like 100 employees and when you talk about uh, how much everybody's earning, then you say, okay, uh, well, that's, if everybody earns like 1,500 euros a month and we need to increase it to 1,700, that is really a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So, and the 20,000 for me, that's, that's not a lot of money. So I think it's a very natural way of thinking. And by putting on this bandwidth from the beginning, when you are um, not at that level, it's a very good start. Like you said, like if you have, um, the value of the shareholder um, uh, uh, shares, shareholder shares, yes, um, and then you have a maximum. It can grow only to two and a half million. I, that, I like that idea. Yeah, and we also we have this, or like our factor is three in the okay. bandwidth between like the lowest and the highest. Um, we also discussed a lot about like we have a, um, I think quite interesting salary process so everything is trans like everybody knows everything about like money in general like there's there are no secrets everyone can uh, know all the numbers and all the salaries as well and we have this process where like everybody basically gives themselves a salary and like on the way there people give each other feedback um and it's i like that i like for me also it's like i like this idea of you know, making everything available to everyone and everyone also has to be part of this, which for me means that we're all like grown ups, you know, it's that you don't have this dynamic that like some people know something that other people don't know. And then you might end up in this dynamic where like it's more like grown ups and kids or something, which I hate. Yeah. And this is more like everyone is a grown up. Everyone has to set their own salary. And everyone has to like get the feedback and give feedback and like, you know, own their own tensions and talk about them. And I, yeah, I think it's good. And one thing I also wanted to mention, because you said that is, I also think it's a quite crazy idea that like, you know, people who already earned the most money in the past also should earn the most money in the future. Because this is, I think, is the assumption that everyone or like most people have in our society, like you could also argue the other way around saying like every right. person who earned, earned the most in the past should get less than the other people because they already had a chance to save up and like become wealthy. Ah, that's, I hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah, of course. 
because like for us when, when we discuss salaries it's also that like this so-called market value of course you know comparing yourself to other people in other organizations or like similar positions is one factor but it's not the only one and i think we tend to like salaries tend to be only be tied to this idea what would i earn some somewhere else and then my my salary has to be similar to that right and do you have like salary discussions once a year so the idea was to do it once a year like since we have just started we're doing it twice a year because hmm. we felt that like this makes the it made the process too scary to know that this has to last then for a year so we said we're going to do it twice a year yeah i i um for the book podcast that we talked about before um we've read the book um delivering happiness by tony shea Hi. um and he has also used a, a couple of interesting ideas within Zappos, um, his company. And one of the things that I really liked and that I talk about um, with uh, entrepreneurs or business owners is the idea of um, making your salary um, connected to your expertise. Mm -hmm. So they have like a academy, internal academy, and they have a library with all these kind of books um, so you can educate yourself and you can choose what kind of education you want. Um, and what they did is that, for example, let's say that in normally if you do this at, um, at, um, uh, progress in your company, it takes you one and a half years to go to the next level. And then you see an increase in your paycheck and you also see an inc a, a different title, for example. Right. So you, you've, mm -hmm. you've stepped up enough uh, one level. But what they saw is if you chop that up in like six steps, so every two to three months, you make a move. And it depends on um, um, your willingness to educate yourself, to follow um, some training in the academy, for example. Um, that is the basis for increase in salary as well, mm -hmm. which, of course, also is transparent. You know what the next steps are, and you can, def you can decide yourself as a grown-up, like you just said, mm -hmm. um, I want to do this. This is, for me, my next goal. And if you, and, and also, if you um, look back at the book Drive, where autonomy um, and a clear goal and so on is really important, and also mastery is really important um, mm -hmm. for people to find their own drive, I think this is a really great connection to make um, how you look at um, salary or um, uh, bonuses and rewards and money. It just popped in my head. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's very good. Uh, Tony died recently. I, I yeah. yeah, yeah, that's very, that was the shame. reason that we um, did the book because mm -hmm. um, we both felt it was a good idea to do the book because he was died. He, he died in November, uh, two thousand twenty, and um, but his ideas are really interesting. But also the book has some twists in there that we thought was really interesting when looking back at it and you know selling it the company to to Amazon and his mm. his. I think. I, I thought about the book earlier in our conversation, but exactly what you described about the dependency on um, shareholders, right? So yeah. he had difficulty with the shareholders at some point, and he wanted to sell it to just one shareholder so he could you know, build on his future idea of a company which is all about happiness. So all these ideas came together in that book for me, so it was a really yeah. interesting. Yeah, and he, I, I, I was quite sad to read that he died. He was a quite decent guy, I think. Um, and like we visited Zappos at some point when when like um, when I was still at Blinkist um, and we were on this journey to explore more like what's possible in this, you know, uh, holocratic or like more decentralized organizations. And Zappos was one of the places I, I took the most inspiration from. And it was also like for me, it was also inspirational because um, Zappos also had this, you know, this positive side of the American stereotype. Like we came there and we were like greeted with open arms and like everyone talked to us and we were like there for one day and just felt like we got to know everyone in the organization, if, even though we had nothing to offer, we we're just like curious, um, which is quite, quite great. And we also got to know Tony, which is also not like, um, like at least in Germany, I think in most organizations, the last thing you would like in most bigger organizations, the last thing you would uh, end up doing is getting to know the CEO and there it was, it was a very good experience. I can imagine, I can imagine, yes. I, I, I yeah, I didn't do that, that's a shame. Um, besides the 
um, the things that you learned about um, ownership and um, autonomy, so self um, organization. What else did you? What else did you, do you think is different about NN publishing? Mm. So, like, I was uh, like in the past, I was always trying to. I was always I was talking a lot about like, okay, so I I discovered the next um, um, like in a computer game, you would say the next level, like the the next harder level in what what can be more progressive in our organization and I, I like i think like for me at least right now the the highest level i know is this ownership level like really be making your uh, like changing the way ownership works in an organization and that's something we did different and i would say that the next level below it is um conflict and feedback like building an organization where really um people give each other honest feedback and uh, like resolve conflict and understand conflict and really make it something um, you know that can be tapped into and used as as like energy and potential um, this is something we also spend uh, lots of time on and i think especially now in these times of like working remotely all the time and never really being in the same room like we only met as a team once last year i think or like twice um, or like oh no, in the beginning of the years people met, but I was I was I was working from from Sicily, so I, I only met the team once in the summer, um, and I think especially now we see that like having thought about this and worked on this, being able to you know even resolve conflict and give feedback when we have pr a problem with someone, it makes it much easier to to work remotely and to work like without ever seeing each other. How how difficult is that? I think it depends on the person. I think for, for me, it was quite difficult because I somehow, like even though I studied psychology, I just, uh, you know, I, I grew up with um, censoring myself a lot and often thinking like this is something I cannot say or something that is like too harsh or too judgmental. So I should keep it to myself and, you know, get over it. Um, why, in, why is that? Why was, is there a reason behind that or was it just nature? I think I, at least here in Germany, I would say that anger, which is something that like I would say is like I'm like usually the emotion I feel when something um, goes over a limit for me is anger. And I think this is something at least here you get taught that this is something that is inappropriate. You don't get angry. Like I think in most organizations, like the only way anger is is seen is like the you know the hysterical or like the choleric boss who explodes and like gets really angry and shouts at people and i never wanted to be that kind of person so the only way was like to to swallow down your anger and just you know get over it or do some sports or meditate it away or something like that so uh, like really trying to learn that like it's possible to you know talk about it and say when you're angry was it was a development for me i have to say not an easy one. Interesting. What did you do to to make this a company culture? So what we are trying to do is to create spaces for all these different um, yeah, mental spaces of the organization, because I think it's it's very, or at least for me, it's very hard to do strategy at the same time as talking about conflict and emotion or like to do uh, to talk about operations and like getting things done while at the same time talking about governance um, because these are completely different ways of thinking for me and what we're trying to do is really like say this is you know we have a space for where we do strategy like a couple of meetings and people know this is now about setting the strategy and the goals for this quarter and we have spaces for like talking operations, like really only about what are next actions, what are our projects, what are the obstacles, uh, which is a completely different mode. And at the same time, we have, you know, spaces for feedback and also spaces for conflict. And also something that I think most many people find a little bit um, funny, but I think it's, it's a good idea. Um, just spaces for like relationship building, which means, you know, getting to know each other more on a personal level, which 
also is something that doesn't really happen in a, or if this happens in an operational meeting, it's a shitty operational meeting. Or if it happens in a strategy meeting, it's a shitty strategy meeting. So I would always prefer separating it, you know, and saying, we don't do that here, but we have a space for it. Hmm. It sounds kind of awkward. And with spaces, you mean um, meetings or what, what, is, what does space mean? I mean, when I say space, I'm on the one hand, I mean, it's like a mental space for me in my head. Yeah. And, and when we create spaces, it's a meeting, of course. Yeah. Right. Right. No, but I, that's what I felt. It felt like something in your head and you clearly want to separate that, which I, th I think also at some point it could be weird because it's uh, when you have a startup meeting and you are angry, then you can't really um, show it or just no, at least not discuss it because you have to wait for the other space to come uh, uh, am i just interpreting this wrong uh no i i think you don't but um what what you what you end up doing is like if if you're getting used to processing your anger and using these spaces to you know resolve the conflicts you have with me then you like you typically don't get very angry about me in a strategy mm -hmm. meeting. Yeah. So if this happens, then it's, you know, a sign for you that oh, we need this other kind of meeting. And maybe we even have to stop now because I can't, you know, think strategy because I have this relationship thing, uh, which is also totally okay. I think to just say, let's stop this now. I have right, a right. relationship problem. Um, but I don't know about you. For me, it was always like, I like this idea of, you know, being in a certain mindset now, for example, mindset of creating something, working on a complex piece of text um, mm -hmm. or being in a strategy modus where I try to think about the future and like priorities and stuff. And I just don't like it when something pops into this space and really tries to get me into a different mindset. No, I can understand um, f from my perspective and also from your perspective, I can understand that you have that you feel that. But of course, then you work with other people together in a team and mm -hmm. When you talk about strategy and and like, like, I just had a coaching conversation. I just brought something up at the end, which I thought was small. It was uh, a, a, like a basis for the next conversation, but I could see at the face of this person, it wasn't small at all. It was really a big thing, and um, and there was emotions there, and it's really f weird to cut off the discussion and for me, uh, but also for her. Um, and because we could, we didn't have the time to continue, but uh, of course it, it, the emotion at that point is really there. And um, so I can also see it, it's, it is, it is, I understand your point of view, but I, also can, I can also understand the other person's point of view when you're in the midst of a strategy meeting and you say something which is, sounds so logical to you as the next step and they go like, what the hell? This is not how I saw it, and then you get this frustration. Um, but let's 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 stop it here because um, I think it works for you, and I I don't want to um, um, turn that around. That's not my idea. Um, you want to change um, the way the people work, and you want to change how journalism works. Um, one thing that I saw about NN Publishing was um, a very open um, uh, year report mm -hmm. kind of thing, a financial report, year report, where you lay out everything about income and everything and the cost. And um, so, so why is that important? Because I can understand it internally that you do that and you share it with only employees. Why do you want to share it externally as well? Mm. So like, on the one hand, we say like we, as we say, we want grown up um, relationships inside the organization. We also want that with our customers. Like we want really to, you know, be on the same level and like have the same information. Um, or like we want the people to have all the information so, so they also know what we want and what we need because we trust that they, um, you know, if we treat them this way, they also want something that is good for us. Um, you probably noticed this book by uh, Rutger Bre Brechmann or how do you I totally like agree to everything he says about like 
um, the like positive view of of people that like if you treat people in a positive way and just assume that they have positive intentions they will end up like doing that exactly and if you treat people by you know giving them incorrect information or trying to manipulate them with with um, marketing and stuff then of course they will interact with your brand or your company in a completely different way and we just like this more um grown-up way even though I mean, it sounds a little bit arrogant but i think you know what i mean yeah yeah i didn't i didn't see it as an arrogant thing <laughs> um you don't want ads in your magazine as a start as a start why didn't you want ads um, so like we came to this magazine world knowing almost nothing about magazines and we were quite surprised about many of the things and like i find it quite surprising to see that like so many print magazines are being printed half of them like half of the paper being printed with rolex advertisement or like other ads um and then half of the magazines end up being you know thrown away before anyone has read them like the whole i think the whole at least i only know this this german model i think it's quite similar in other countries um but i don't think it's it's a good way to copy something like that which is so not up to date anymore and printing ads into a print magazine while like the costs or like the the prices people are paying for that are decreasing all the time because everyone now is online i think it's just a crazy idea so uh we didn't want to do that and like uh, we also like our impression was in the beginning we would do ads but only for companies we think are great and those companies wouldn't pay for ads they would only want to be there for free and the companies who would pay money for like you know full site uh, full page advertisements we don't want them in our in our magazine um, what we ended up doing is you know we have partners who can appear in in the magazine with their logo and they can say something about themselves which is something like we find like is is increasing the value of the magazine it's like i think a normal ad would decrease the value and this is like just you know showing your partners which is something that increases the value and it's like a good good way to work together what, what is how is it based because you said you talk about partners do they each pay the same um, amount of money to be a partner do you have different levels how do you organize this mm. So this is now, now we get into the, into the world of roles. Like we work with roles in the organization, which means like roles are autonomous, you know, pieces of responsibility where someone makes decisions. And I don't have any roles that are involved with like these partnerships and B2B. So okay. I, 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 you know, I can come up with something, but it's probably not, okay. not accurate. That's okay. It's, it's fine. Okay. I want to um, uh, go a little bit into the book um, because I think, what you did in the book, um, tell me if I'm wrong, most of it are you using to build the NN publishing? Mm, no, so the book, like, um, I would, if I have to summarize the value of the book, I would say it's like a um, team based transformation framework. So um, yes, we are, are using a similar framework to develop our own organization. Um, but the whole like the concept um, came up when we were working with like bigger companies like corporates trying to help them, you know, transform the ways they work and like become more agile. And um, my impression was that like teams are really important focus there. That, like if you want to change an organization, you have to change the way teams work. Uh, that's why it ended up like a team based process um, or a framework and we also figured that like there are all these great tools out there like holacracy getting things done nonviolent communication but it's so much that it's really hard to you know look at everything and figure like learn everything or find out the the right tools and what we were trying to do is give a framework where people at least know these are the questions we need to ask and then find like you know certain tools or elements of tools that we can use to answer the questions and um I think it makes transformations much easier rather than like saying we have to learn holacracy completely and then we have to learn TTD and then we have to learn NVC and then the next 10 things, which of course is not possible for a big organization and even for a small one. Uh, 
the book um, came from your work at uh, the dive. Exactly. And you are now more involved with um, NN Publishing. Um, how important is the book to you now? Mm. So, like the book is is something we developed at the at the dive. So it's like I wrote it with a few more people, but like many people contributed there at the dive, and um, the dive is doing like um, consulting and also um, like teaching teaching people to become change agents in the organization based on this because I think it's just a powerful framework you can use when you're doing these kinds of transformations. Um, I'm I'm currently not doing any transformations anymore. I'm you know I'm focusing on publishing stuff. So it's I'm not going into organizations and using the framework much because I'm just I'm in the publishing world now and not no longer in the um, consulting world. I, but I can also imagine that now people ask you for interviews, for example, <laughs> on the basis of the book. I didn't for me it was not because I found out the book later on. So, but um, do you? Do you still do it? Because I can understand that it's kind of um, weird. You are focusing on completely on NM publishing, and then you could ask about tech, talking, talking about um, the loop approach. Is it is it happening, or is it just in my mind? <laughs> it is happening, and I was trying to do it in parallel in the beginning, and then just figured it's going to kill me. And also, like starting, like we started NM publishing. Like we had, we had a basic product, but it was far away from you know being a business model, um, and we wanted to do the steward ownership, and we we're only three people. So like, and then having this, idea, Lena and I were both thinking that we can do it. Like, and even Martin in the beginning was also thinking because we all like to do things in parallel. We all thought we can do like uh, two things at the same time, and it was just not a good idea. And so at some point we had to decide. And um, well, for me, it was this decision also to say, um, I want to do the new thing because it's um, it's so exciting. And like, I, I get these requests and it's always, sometimes it's a little bit sad then to say, okay, now you have to talk to someone else because I'm not doing this anymore. But it's also good to see that this, you know, there's, there, there are people who are much more competent than I because they have been working with this framework much more than I did. You know, I was only there in the beginning when we developed it, and now there's my name on the book. It's the same as with Blinkist, you know, I'm still one of the founders. And like there are people in the organization who worked there twice as long as I did, because uh, but nobody talks about them because they, they're not founders, which I think is paradoxical. How do you, how do, you do that with um, the NN uh, publishing? How do, you, how do you change that problem? Mm. It's a good question. I'm still like, I'm, I don't have the answers there because I'm like, I'm hoping that it's possible to, you know, even in, if people join the company in five years that they will, you know, step up and be like fully responsible. And maybe then I will have retired or something um, or taking the big house and the big car and won't be, and I, nobody's going to ask me anymore. Um, I'm optimistic that this is possible. It might also be that, you know, having been there in the beginning, like building the first bits of the company makes a difference. Um, but we're trying to find out and we're trying to remove the obstacles. I think this idea of, you know, you and me owning the organization, everyone else just being an employee with a salary, that's a huge obstacle to, you know, being, being equals. Yeah, and I also think at the moment, uh, like you said, when everybody is the owner of the company, it feels different. And when you are very transparent, like you published the year report of NN Publishing um, publicly, um, it, it, it becomes very different to ask just you about this, right? Like, you just, like I just asked you about the whole model about the um, partners. Is that's that's not one of your roles, so you really can't answer that question correctly or um, with more with, with confidence. So, I think also with the 
um, self-organization, we have all these kind of roles, you could, you could change and rotate roles so that um, it will be less difficult to see one person as a hero in the company. I think that is that we, that we talk about uh, uh, more often is a, a very anglo-sexic is that German, is that English mm -hmm. <laughs> um, way is that there is the owner the founder of the company that's really a hero right he mm -hmm. or she makes all the decisions and gets all the credits and all the stories are about the owner while at the same time um, he or she doesn't build the company anymore because all the other employees built the company. Most of the decisions that are made during the day are made by like a hundred other people than the owner. Mm -hmm. So I think all the, the whole idea of the owner being the hero is is a really far fetched, strange idea. I think if if you talk to Piketty, then he would probably say again that like this is you know you need this narrative to justify the inequalities if you have like a, yeah. a model where like some people are billionaires and other people have nothing then you, you need some kind of narrative because otherwise you have this you know discrepancy in the head that people if, if if there's no explanations for these differences people will start like a civil war right away yeah um so we need these narratives to justify this and i also think as, as i liked that you brought this up like because I also think if you look closer at it is it's all bullshit this risk taking uh, you know most of at least in Berlin like most of the founder heroes come from rich families and yeah. like you know taking taking a risk of you know not having a big salary um, for a couple of years it's not a risk for someone who comes from a wealthy background or has like savings um, in that sense it's much it's much more brave you know someone having no money starting like a little um food shop or something but nobody talks about them yeah no i agree so um I, that's exactly why i wanted to talk to you um and i think it's a good way to end this conversation um because i know that we could talk for a longer 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 time about this topic um but i think that this is exactly the point the point what I'm looking for in entrepreneurs like you to learn from how can you do this differently because I know why it needs to be differently right so I, I understand it needs to be differently because the whole trickle down story another another story right mm -hmm. um, uh, the whole story about get, taking the most risk for the shareholders the whole story about the founder making the most tough decisions, that's all just BS. Mm -hmm. And um, I've, it, it may be just time for a revolution. I'm not sure, it, it could be time, but we could also maybe prevent a revolution if we have more people like you um, doing this in their own company and also talking about it, how you could do this differently. And that's why I, I, I love talking to you um, thank you very much, Sebastian, for sharing your ideas, not just here in this episode, but also uh, by um, being so open about NN Publishing and um, all the things that you just talked about. I, I loved it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you as well. It was very enjoyable for me too. Good.